this is for me not just another undergraduate class. How often do I have the Vice President for Academic Affairs sitting in my audience? Or how often do I have so many um, students from earlier years, like Robert Miller here or Jesse Russell? Uh, also, um, I realize I'm facing a very well-prepared audience, unlike my beginners in philosophy. Some of you are even yourselves professors of philosophy. So uh, with great anticipation, I look forward to this uh, work together. And uh, I'd like to say, uh, first off, that the uh, longer I teach, the more I realize that I have been lecturing too much. Uh, and so I hope uh, this morning to more lead a discussion with you uh, rather than to give a long lecture. And a long lecture would be particularly inappropriate for an audience like this. You've been reading the works of von Hildebrand in preparation for this seminar. So you hold me to that, and if I lapse into um, too much lecturing, you interrupt with your questions and um, see to it that this really has the discussion format that it ought to have. Now, I know that many of you are mainly interested in von Hildebrand's thought on man and woman and marriage. That was clear from many of your self-introductions uh, yesterday. But this part of his thought on man and woman is embedded in a philosophy of love. And so we thought that the, the right way to conduct the seminar was to uh, devote, well, as you see from the syllabus, more or less the first two days of the seminar to von Hildebrand's philosophy of love. Uh, and only then will we turn to his thought on man and woman which, as I say, is set within this larger uh, philosophy. Now, my plan for uh, today is this. First of all, I want to open with a text from the great Kierkegaard, a text on human love that is fundamentally opposed to the approach of von Hildebrand. And the reason I open... Uh, this way is, um, well, I'm just following the good example of St. Thomas Aquinas. You know how in the Summa, when he wants to hold a position, he doesn't just start declaring and arguing for his position, but he leads with the strongest objections he can find to his position. And then at the end, he returns to those objections. And that's the way of philosophy, working through some issue by encountering the most serious objections. So my thinking was that if von Hildebrand is right about human love, uh, then we'll understand that all the better after we've encountered uh, these very challenging objections of Kierkegaard. And there will be other this afternoon. Maria Walter will bring up other objections to the position of von Hildebrand. So we work it through in a properly philosophical way. Now, that's the first item on today's agenda. Then I'll proceed to this central notion in von Hildebrand that love is what he calls a value response. I'll explain that technical term, what it means, what it does not mean. Um, and, then, and, and there I'll be making reference mainly to chapter one in the treatise on love. And then I'll consider with von Hildebrand how it is that love is a very particular kind of value response, in some ways unlike all other value responses. And there I'll be making reference mainly to chapter 3. And that's the plan for the morning. We follow up then in the afternoon with Maria Walter raising from contemporary philosophy other objections to uh, the uh, value response philosophy of love that von Hildebrand has. So, let's um, turn right to that discourse of Kierkegaard that I 
gave you with the title, You Shall Love Your Neighbor, Neighbor Underlined. It's taken from this work, one of the most important of Kierkegaard's works, entitled Works of Love. Uh, and it is uh, a very significant, very original, very powerful study of love. Uh, but that there is this point of antagonism between von Hildebrandt and Kierkegaard that I'd like to lead with now. So <clears throat> you open the discourse of Kierkegaard and you notice that we have um, uh, a twofold distinction. On the one hand, there's Christian love of neighbor. And on the other hand, there's what Kierkegaard calls human love. And as you read the text, you see that human love comprises friendship, love of friendship, and what he calls erotic love, which means simply the love between man and woman. Those are the two capital forms of human love for Kierkegaard. Now, I, uh, I'm sure you gathered uh, Kierkegaard's provocative thesis from your reading. Uh, his thesis is that only Christian love of neighbor deserves to be called love at all. These human loves, including the love between man and woman, aren't really love, properly speaking, at all. So, uh, obviously, uh, von Hildebrand's work, say, on marriage, on the love between man and woman, which you've read, uh, could hardly be written on a Kierkegaardian basis because he takes that form of human love very seriously. It's a very real, authentic kind of love. So let's try to understand what's behind Kierkegaard's idea that these human loves don't really count as love at all. In fact, he goes so far as to say that Christianity has dethroned the human loves and established the Christian love of neighbor as the only real thing in the world of love. So, I might put it to you. What do you see as Kierkegaard's reasons for this so surprising and severe judgment on human love? What, um, because he doesn't just assert it, there are, oh, I counted three or four plausible reasons uh, in the discourse uh, for that position, and uh, it would interest me to hear what uh, may, what, what caught your attention. Uh, what do you suppose would be the main uh, grievance of Kierkegaard against human love? Yes, Kevin. One of his concerns is that human love is preferential. Exactly. And yeah. Excludes the third. Excludes others. Uh, exactly. Ex right. So there's a uh, like the love between man and woman is highly preferential. You love just this one woman, just this one man, to the exclusion of all others. Um, or if you think of the love between friends, you, uh, you have a few close friends, but the rest of the world are non-friends. So there's this exclusivity uh, or particularity or preferential character of human love. By contrast, uh, uh, the love of neighbor is universal. You extend that to every neighbor that you meet. That's not reserved for some and withheld from others. That's a love for everyone. And that universality of the Christian love of neighbor seems to Kierkegaard to imply a greater breadth and generosity of love. And he detects something narrow in the human love with its preferential uh, character. What else? There are some, uh, I think Kevin has named maybe the, the, the first uh, and most obvious point, but there, um, there are some other uh, interesting uh, grievances of Kierkegaard against. Yes, sister. Mm 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That that's up. That's well put um, uh, there in, in just a few words. There's a certain incurable selfishness he thinks in all human love, and he um, picks up the um, idea of Aristotle that in friendship, the friend is another I, and uh, the idea is that well your natural self-love uh, extends over to this other I. And Kierkegaard says, but that's just treating the love of friendship as an expanded self-love. Uh, and he says, in love of neighbor, by contrast, I, uh, I don't take the other as another I, whom I love with this expanded self-love, but I take the other as a thou, really taking the other in his or her otherness. That's real love. That's stepping out of my natural self-love. Uh, that is, and, and it's very interesting, you know, that talk of the I-thou relation that comes into currency only in the 20th century with Martin Buber. Here it is already in Kierkegaard, in his thought about love of neighbor. Uh, so, anything else? Um, yeah, please, Maria. So, inclinations, um, they have only right. a lot of All right, yeah. Charles, the obligation. Yeah, yeah right. that's, that's ex exactly right. He thinks that human love is a matter, as he says in one place, of mood and inclination. Uh, whereas love of neighbor, that's an, that's, that's an obligation. That's an imperative. That's not left up to my mood or inclination. I have to act like the good Samaritan in the gospel that we heard on Sunday. Uh, whereas there's something subjective about whether I connect with another so as to have him or her as a friend, something subjective about what uh, opens up a... Uh, spousal love uh, with another person. So there's something you might say almost whimsical, mood-based, uh, highly subjective about these human loves, whereas there's a stern imperative to love every neighbor. And that shows the greater seriousness of love in love of neighbor, according to Kierkegaard. That's good. I think... Uh, you've captured the main uh, points. Uh, each of you have brought out something different, uh, starting with Kevin on the preferential character of human love, and then what Sister said about this self-centered character of human love, this expansion of self-love, uh, and then uh, finally this subjective, almost... Um, uh, arbitrary, whimsical character, as opposed to the obligatory character of uh, love of neighbor. And there's perhaps one other point. Uh, it would be included, I think, under uh, the selfish, alleged selfishness of human love. And that is, uh, Kierkegaard notes that in the human loves, you await a return of love. If you love, if a man loves a woman, with spells of love, well, of course, he wants to be loved in return. And he goes away as an unhappy lover if there's no return of his love. And the same holds for friendship, too. You offer friendship to another, uh, and you, you, you want that offer to be returned. You want the friendship to be mutual. Otherwise, there's a profound disappointment of love. And Kierkegaard says, but look at uh, the love of neighbor. Uh, the good Samaritan who helps the injured man, he's not waiting for some return of love. He just generously performs this act of love of neighbor. And, um, and that's a complete act of love. He doesn't Require he doesn't go away 
bitterly disappointed if the injured man whom he helped doesn't somehow return the love to him. So it's more one-sided, it's more independent of any longing for requital. And therefore, it's a more generous love. Uh, this is evidence of that um, self-centeredness of human love, this longing for a requital. And so, Kierkegaard, with these um, various um, points of contrast between human love and love of neighbor, uh, goes so far as to say that Christianity, and here he echoes uh, those well-known words of, uh, in one of the epistles of St. John, that Christianity has cast out all preferential love and has established love of neighbor as the only love worthy of the name of love. Well, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a conception of human love, especially the love between man and woman, as opposed as could be to the approach of uh, von Hildebrand. But <clears throat> I would suggest that following the example of St. Thomas, we uh, not try to respond right away to Kierkegaard. Let's let the, these objections stand and percolate, and let's turn to von Hildebrand's account of love, and then we'll have occasion as we go, maybe later today, maybe tomorrow, to revisit Kierkegaard and see what can be said uh, in uh, defense of von Hildebrand. All right. So, I, I, I should add uh, that I almost feel bad using Kierkegaard like this because I do greatly esteem uh, his work. He really is a very, very great Christian thinker. Uh, and in, in fact, we're celebrating the 200th anniversary of his uh, birth this year. And von Hildebrand himself had a great veneration of uh, Kierkegaard. So, um, by opening with this um, antagonism between Kierkegaard and von Hildebrand. I don't want to uh, obscure uh, the, um, the, the greatness uh, of, of him. And, and even in this work, Works of Love, there are treasures of Christian wisdom about love. All right. So, <clears throat> that's the first item on today's agenda. Um, let's turn to the second one, the biggest one, um, explaining this foundational Hildebrandian idea that love is a value response. Now, that's clearly a kind of technical term in the work of von Hildebrand. So I thought I would first explain a little this idea of value response with examples taken from outside of love. And then we'll see what's meant by calling love a uh, value response. Now, let's um, keep it concrete. Uh, take the response of admiration for another person. Let's suppose I'm filled with admiration for the courage of uh, a person. Well, that admiration would be a typical value response in the language of von Hildebrand. And that means that in admiring the person, I am aware that the admired person is worthy of my admiration. I don't just whimsically admire because I feel like it. It's called for. This, this courageous person merits my admiration. It's only fitting and right to admire. If I know 
about his courage and just remain indifferent, untouched with admiration, something's wrong with me. So um, the, the key uh, idea of value response is this worthiness of the response, the fact that the response is called for uh, by uh, the value or by the person here, the courageous person who has this moral value of uh, courage. So it's <clears throat> very unlike, say, my interest in pizza. I might like it, but however much I like it, I certainly don't think it's worthy of being liked, or that it merits being liked. Uh, even less do I think there's something wrong with a person who doesn't like it. So uh, there you've got interest and responses that um, lack entirely that sense of the response being somehow owed injustice to the value. And so you get an idea of, of of value in von Hildebrand's special sense. It doesn't have anything to do with economic value. But value is that inner goodness in virtue of which a being is worthy of some appropriate response. You can take other examples. Take an example from the religious life. Um, Adoration. That would be a typical value response because Whoever adores God adores in the consciousness that God is worthy of being adored. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Now, it often happens in philosophy that um, the, the, the edge of a thinker's thought comes out only with the help of certain contrasts. Let me now offer a contrast that I think brings out the edge of this value response idea in von Hildebrand. Let's stay with the case of admiration. Uh, Let's suppose that I seek out the company of this admired person. I want to be benefited by the company of that person. I think that, well, my own efforts at courage will be reinforced by associating with him or her. So I think his company does me good. It helps me to grow and flourish as a human being. Now, that's a very natural and entirely legitimate way of approaching the admired person. But when Hildebrand wants us to realize it's not exactly a value response. You see, because the value response is more radically centered on the admired person. I see his or her moral excellence and am filled with admiration in response. There's no reference to me and my flourishing in the admiration. Now, when I begin to think of how my association with the admired person can be beneficial for me, that's a new kind of approach. Uh, that's, uh, I'm now taking the admired person under a different aspect, taking him under the aspect of how he can benefit me. Whereas in simply admiring, I uh, took the admired person in his own right, according to that intrinsic moral excellence of his courage. And there was no...
this preoccupation with how it bears on me, what it means for me and my flourishing. We transcend ourselves in the sense of getting caught up in what this moral excellence means in its own right. Uh, and our whole, our whole life would be, he thinks, cramped and constrained. Uh, it would lack a certain inner freedom, and certainly a, it would lack a certain transcendence if it were always only the question, what makes me flourish? What benefits me? Uh, that very legitimate concern has to be connected with and grounded in this, uh, this value-responding affirmation of uh, the, well, to stay with the example, with the cor- courageous person, you might say, for his own sake, uh, for the sake of that moral splendor that he shows. And uh, if I can't again and again go back to that value-responding self-transcendence, uh, the, the whole structure of my life is too self-absorbed. Even though in itself that desire to flourish and be benefited, uh, especially in the way I described, is entirely legitimate. Uh, go back to the example of adoration. Uh, we can make this, um, this point of contrast there, too. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the value-responding adoration. Uh, God is worthy of uh, my adoration. But the same God whom I adore, uh, I also approach as redeemer, protector, uh, father, rock, refuge, shepherd, helper in distress. So, uh, of course, we approach God from the point of view of what benefits us in various respects and makes us flourish. But, again, Van Hildebrand would say, if a person's religious life is completely taken over by that concern of what God means for me, and my salvation, and has no place for this freedom of adoration where I venerate God simply in the understanding he is worthy of it, then my religious life is somehow compromised and restricted. So that is, um, you might say, a signature concept of von Hildebrand, this this value response uh, and especially the, the self-transcendence that we achieve in it. And that appears most clearly in contrast to this legitimate interest uh, in how uh, something is beneficial for me. Well, this idea, as I say, is found everywhere in his philosophy. It's at the foundation of all of his work in moral philosophy. And it is central to his philosophy of love. That's what uh, concerns us uh, in this course. Love as a value response. But maybe before going, uh, taking that step uh, to love, we should, I, I should take questions and comments on this very idea of value response. And it's self-transcending character. Yes, Jesse. Um, like, I think he says that values are like effectively, effectively yeah. apprehended. Like, what role mm. does reason play in yeah. apprehending values? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, there are different notions of reason. You know, there's uh, strictly analytic reason. Uh, uh, but there's a, a, a broader, more abundant kind of reason uh, by which we experience value. So for von Hildebrand, when I am full of admiration for the courageous person, uh, that there's a certain kind of reason at work. I mean, there's an intellectual act whereby 
that moral value of courage uh, presents itself to me and awakens uh, my admiration. So, uh, you know, from the point of view of positivistic reason, um, that uh, perception of the moral value of a courageous person wouldn't count as reason at all. Uh, but in his perspective, it does. It's a way in which something that's really there in the other person is apprehended and understood and experienced and then responded. Go ahead, Jesse. I was thinking in terms of like St. Thomas and Aristotle. Like, yeah. Is it like where I see courage and then I understand yeah. what it is afterwards or is it more something from the yeah. heart? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, um, th- th- there is, um, in von Hildebrand's whole uh, understanding of love, a very strong emphasis on the heart uh, and the affectivity of love is very greatly stressed. Uh, now, I don't want to encroach upon the territory of Maria Walter because uh, that's the theme tomorrow morning, I think. Uh, uh, the love as an affective response, as a prompting of the heart. But uh, it's a prompting of the heart that's not just you know, uh, an irrational kind of um, urge, but it ha- there's, a, a, there's a certain cognition of value uh, that awakens the value response, or a cognition of the beauty of a person that awakens the, uh, the love. And so for, for Hildred always resists uh, the slogan, love is blind. He says, no, the one who really loves sees something. He sees a certain splendor of the beloved person. And seeing that, his love is awakened. And if by reason you mean the power of the person to uh, uh, register what's really there in the real world, and this is eminently an act of reason, uh, though not analytic reason, So the Pascalian line, you know, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. That was uh, something frequently cited by Van Hildebrand. Yes, uh, Margaret. So this is, it's, this question is somewhat, somewhat related. So is this, is a value response simply an intuitive response? So is this, right, is this an argument yeah. that the heart is the one that has the Yeah. And that's where we, that's where we begin. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think he w- would say, yeah, the, the, the admiration is an experience. Uh, it's not a highly intellectual uh, thing. Our reflection here in this class is an intellectual, philosophical reflection. But the admiration is a lived experience that uh, uh, you have in face of uh, something really admirable. Yeah. And right, yeah. so it seems that, that this like, this is very appealing if you know what, if you've experienced Right, it, right, like, right, but right. But if you have it, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, Van Hildebrand uh, uh, goes back to um, and, and, and completely concurs with that ancient wisdom of, of Aristotle that there's a kind of moral knowledge that you have only if you bring a good moral character. And if you don't do that, then uh, you shouldn't expect to be able to discern uh, what's morally beautiful or morally sordid. There's a kind of, he often speaks of value blindness. And that's not just a lack of intelligence, but uh, a defect of character. Uh, So there's a a great deal in von Hildebrand about all, uh, all the special demands made upon us to find and respond to the values, uh, especially the moral values of the world. Uh, it's a demanding kind of uh, knowing that uh, uh, 
and, and, and for him it's not at all, just like for Aristotle, it wasn't at all surprising that with a, a deficient character, why you become simply blind to uh, not many moral virtues and vices. Uh, yeah, so the idea of value response with that signature self-transcendence, uh, that for the sake of the admired person, for the sake of the adored God. That is the edge there of his thought on value response that I'd like to uh, bring out at this point. Yeah, please. Uh, um, Mary Claire. Yes. Right, yes. Uh, with regard to your comparison with Kierkegaard, it seems uh -huh. to me that and correct me if I'm wrong in finding this common ground, but they both seem to have a, a concern for love that is selfish. And so with love of neighbor, he's yeah. saying that you know human love is purely selfish. Yeah. And real friend with value response yeah. is saying something like we don't want a love that's purely concerned about right. you know, you know uh, right. the lovers flourishing or right. the benefits. And so do they have a similar concern there? And then they're diverging from that point? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, von Hildebrand um, uh, recognizes all kinds of selfish distortions of love. Uh, and, and so in that sense, he and Kierkegaard are on the same page. That There's the real thing, and then there are all the human corruptions of it. Uh, the, to that extent, they're uh, together. Um, but I think there's maybe more to your question. Uh, go ahead, Mary Claire. Um, no, I was just, you know, I was trying to figure out where they, where they diverge, the point yeah. of departure. Yeah, well, the point of departure is, uh, of divergence is simply the idea that certain kinds of human love as such are intrinsically selfish and therefore by their very nature can't count as real love. And von Hildebrand wants to contest that with regard to love of friendship, the love between man and woman. And uh, consider, if he's right, that love is a value response, uh, that it has this freedom and this self-transcendence of value response, then love, human love, is after all worth more than Kierkegaard had allowed. Well, this would already provide a first kind of response to Kierkegaard. If uh, von Hildebrand has it right that love is a certain kind of value response. Well, <clears throat> that's his uh, uh, thesis uh, regarding love. Whoever loves another person, he says, has glimpsed something of value uh, in the other and, as with all value response, feels the other to be worthy of love. And he brings out how in the case of love, this value that awakens love is uh, a value with a certain radiance of beauty. Uh, it's when the goodness uh, and value of a person in all its beauty makes itself felt that love is uh, awakened. Uh, but he claims that this basic structure of value response is found uh, here in love. And so, <coughs> von Hildebrand differs uh, from uh, the famous uh, teaching of Plato in the Republic. There's a wonderful passage on love. It's not the Republic, excuse me, in the Symposium, where Plato says that uh, love is born of need. Love is the cry of the needy creature for something that will fulfill its need. And therefore, Plato says, God doesn't love because he's not needy. Only creatures who lack a lot are in a position to love. And their love is nothing more than reaching out for that which fulfills the uh, need and takes away the pain of lack. And von Hildebrand objects, and you can see now easily enough why, that the value response character of love tends to be lost. The beloved object uh, is taken 
under the aspect of what relieves my need. Uh, and that interferes with this value-responding affirmation of the beloved for his or her own sake. And so, Orvin Hildebrand, that would be a, a good example of an account of love that makes too much of this desire to flourish and be perfected and to be fulfilled. Uh, in Plato, that idea tends to push out uh, the uh, value-responding heart of love. So, <clears throat> there you have the basic um, conception that uh, love is um, it's not blind, it's seeing, and um, when a person sees this beauty in the other, the uh, love is awakened. The position of Van Hildebrandt is exactly the opposite of the position that Maria Walter will present from Harry Frankfurt this afternoon, namely uh, the position that we first love and then the beloved person uh, then the value for us. The Van Hildebrand position is no. First comes the experience of the beauty of the beloved person. And out of that experience arises the love. The love wouldn't exist at all as the real thing if there weren't some uh, strongly experienced beauty uh, at the origin of uh, the love. So, uh, this idea of value response, von Hildebrand claims uh, uh, to find in all the categories of love. So, we don't just have love in general, but we've got the different kinds, the parental love, the man-woman love, the love of God, uh, the love between friends, and in all of these kinds, or as he says, categories of love, uh, this value response structure uh, is at uh, the center. And as I say, um, once we uh, say that, and, and say it of the love between man and woman, that it has a value responding structure, then we've already got a reason to esteem uh, this love between man and woman more highly than Kierkegaard did. All right. Now, um, if you read there closely in chapter one, you can see there are a number of objections that he poses to his own position. And... Um, I've got some of them noted here, but uh, you may, uh, maybe we should do this at your initiative. Which of the objections that he raises to himself uh, do you find most challenging? Would you like to discuss first? Uh, must be three or four that um, are really interesting. They're plausible objections. And uh, they force him to uh, take his position to a deeper level. Jesse, did you have? Um, I, I, I think this is what you're asking, but uh, uh, he responds that to, the, to the objection of the idea that the overall beauty of the person is the result of and not the basis yeah. of love. Seems to be, he argues that there's some sort of initial mm -hmm. value response, and then that response mm -hmm. opens up a perception of more value. Mm -hmm. Like, is, is that yeah. what Von Hildebrand is arguing there? Yeah, well, <clears throat> well, there's a first approach to a person, um, which has to be a, a, an approach with a certain loving openness. And um, if in that approach, I detect and experience something of particular beauty, 
then I can begin to love that other. Uh, but it will take some kind of beauty basis, let's say, uh, in my experience of the other for me to love. And then that, that where, where in contrast to the view that the appearance of beauty arises uh, after I've already loved. You know, as a kind of afterglow of my already existing love. But is he arguing, though, that, that it is possible like, that that love will open up more value? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, that's an intriguing uh, aspect of love, that when you love um, a person, uh, you become alive to the beauty of the person. So uh, there's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of happy circularity here, where you love, uh, and, in, and in loving, you, your eyes are open for uh, still other beauty in the beloved person. And seeing that, you love still more. So uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that mutuality of loving and coming to know the goodness and beauty of the beloved person, that interplay, that mutual support of each for the other is uh, uh, a big theme in uh, this first chapter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, objections. Uh, let's uh, see what um, uh, objection that he raises. Maybe he raises some objections that uh, you don't think he answers sufficiently. Yes, Damien. Well, it's a question that I'm intrigued by the what makes this notion that first comes this movement and then comes the value plausible in the first place. Yeah. Right? Is there any basis? But what makes it plausible? And I don't know whether this yeah. is an appropriate question at this point or not. Yeah. But apparently it has some force and the force is not simply by definition. No, it's not by definition. No. Yeah. Well, you know, I think um, the, um, the basis for his claim is an appeal to your and my experience of love. Uh, if I approach you in a loving way, I clearly, and, and he's appealing to the fact that we all experience this, see more of value in you than if I approach in a kind of hostile and hypercritical way, you know, looking for your flaws and faults, then I don't see much. And so he wants to say, um, don't we all know that from our experience of uh, encountering other persons? Uh, that it takes a certain kind of approach to be alive to the value and beauty of the other. And that once I do love another, that uh, still new dimensions of the beauty of the beloved person show themselves. I think he, his appeal here is not, like you say, by definition, but um, his appeal is to our experience of loving and being loved. And so you've got a good objection if you can show something in our experience that doesn't fit that claim. Yes, please. Uh, 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 Andrew. Andrew, yes. Um, just uh, wondering if the notion of value yeah. as a notion yeah. you know, has a history, because yeah. it certainly appears in modern philosophy. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And where, where, how did it yeah. get to von Hildebrand? Yes, right. Yes, no, it is um, a, a, a modern development, and um, it, it's something uh, uh, different from the traditional good or bonum. Value has a somewhat different uh, resonance. Uh, and uh, so, uh, 
for von Hildebrand, you know, good in the traditional sense of bonum is very close to what benefits me, perfects me, actualizes me. And so value is useful uh, to him to express this, um, this splendor of something that it, that it has in its own right and that awakens the value response. Uh, but, you know, the term, uh, I know, is often uh, uh, you know, used in a very subjective way. Well, your values are different from my values. And I don't value that. You might, I don't. So, um, you know, it gets tossed around in a highly subjectivist way. And uh, so one has to uh, notice that in the discourse of von Hildebrand, it has a very objective meaning. I mean, the, val- the, 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 the moral value of someone's courage is something very real. It's an objective value. It's something that's, you know, uh, a part of the fabric of the real world, and you make a mistake if you don't acknowledge it. So he has that objective sense of value. Uh, but you know, uh, C.S. Lewis um, uh, uh, often uses value in exactly the sense of an Hildebrand. So, like in the abolition of man, he speaks of the doctrine of objective value. And he means the fact that some things merit a certain response. So, um, value can, um, uh, as in Lewis, be used in a strong objective sense like von Hildebrand uses it. Uh, I like to quote that um, famous definition of Oscar Wilde to show how value can uh, be expressive of uh, just what von Hildebrand means. You know, um, Oscar Wilde says, the cynic is the one who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. It's exactly the von Hildebrandian sense, the intrinsic worth or excellence of a thing. Uh, and so their value isn't used in any sense of economic value, but it's precisely contrasted with price by Oscar Wilde. Yes, uh, Margaret. Do you suppose then that it's correct to say that for von Hildebrand, a value response is simply through the, contempt, uh, the contemplation of the good in the yeah. other person, right? So that it's yeah. not that this person is good for something, but seeing the right. this person is simply, right. simply, simply Right. You could say there's a certain goodness in itself, mm-hmm. an intrinsic goodness, an intrinsic uh, excellence or splendor. That's what he means mm-hmm. by value. That's the thing which then uh, elicits the value response. And so he wants to say, with love, we've got to find that point of splendor uh, or value uh, before real, well-ordered love can uh, awaken. So just to think of human flourishing like uh, Plato does in the symposium would not uh, give us an adequate view of love. Yes, uh, Mary Claire. Um, I see you were asking for objections. Please. The one that he addresses here is the conflation that I guess happens between value response and and then... um, appetite, desire, drive. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And um, to me, it seems like he goes so far in distinguishing them mm-hmm. um, that he almost neglects the role of inclination. Yeah, you right. Have this sort of, as human beings, we have this right, desire to right. reach out to others, and, and right. that is what sort of inclines us right, to right. receive the good in others. Right. Right? So it seems like he's right. driving a wedge there to respond to that objection. Yeah. He's almost doing a disservice to the yeah. role of appetite. Then. I, I, don't know, I just wanted to hear your response. To that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that... Uh, that that's um, one objection that uh, that love uh, just arises in us um, uh, as a kind of drive analogous to hunger and thirst, and the love seeks its object and loves that which fulfills the drive, and of course uh, that all freedom and for the sake of the other uh, value response is lost. Uh, it. Um, the other uh, then is just taken under the aspect of what? Um, 
satisfies my drive or completes it. Now, there is also in um, the, uh, toward the end of uh, chapter one, this uh, uh, very, uh, very beautiful idea of uh, certain, you might say, drives which are such that they are fulfilled by value response. So he says, surely in every human heart there is a need to love, a need to be loved. Uh, Plato wasn't wrong about that. And uh, he says, but that's a need, a, a real and legitimate human need, which is such that the only thing that really can fulfill it is a value-responding love. So he says, when you bring needs into the discussion, you shouldn't just think of needs that appropriate their object and use it for their satisfaction. There's a kind of noble value-responding need, uh, a longing for, like the longing for God in every human heart, a primordial metaphysical need. But what alone fulfills that need is the discovery of God, a value-responding uh, veneration of God. And so there's a need, uh, like Aristotle says, all men desire to know the truth. But the truth known is not just like a means to satisfy the need, but it's something worthy in its own right. And that alone um, can really satisfy that noble metaphysical need. So that, that's, um, uh, I, I think, of an important Hildebrandian notion that there are needs, you might say, there's a need for value response. There's a need to transcend myself in this way, for the inner freedom of value response, for being caught up in the inner splendor of that to which I give the value response. And that need can be fulfilled only if what fulfills it is more than just mere need fulfillment, but is something worthy in its own right. I, I, I don't know if that falls in with your question. I think, I think what helped me was, I guess you did the example of someone who um, is developing their teaching skill. Yeah, right. And in yeah. You know, conveying the truth to others, um, and serving the yeah. truth, he's also fulfilling his need to develop himself as a teacher. So right. the two things go yeah. hand in hand. Right, right, so, right. So that sort of works for me. But I guess yeah. um, where I have a problem is that there is a certain drive and inclination that starts the process. Yes. Yeah. Rather than just sort of a disinterested um, yeah. appreciation mm -hmm. or admiration of a value, right, it seems right. like maybe particularly in, in human love, yeah, um, right. there is like the, the drive. Right. That yes, right, 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 yeah. Well, you know, he even, he even says that with regard to the love between man and woman, there it can be a certain sensual responsiveness, say, of man to woman, woman to man. Uh, and that can, you know, easily become a kind of using. But, he says, it can also, you know, open the heart for a real love. Carol Wojtyla has some wonderful thoughts about this, um, this attraction between man and woman that at first is a fairly sensual thing, providing a kind of, um, of material for, or a point of departure, for a, a real value-responding love. Uh, so does that... Uh, okay, so it works yeah. that way as well. Yes, okay. yes, that, that's what I think he means to say. Yes, uh, Jane. Oh, yes, right. He doesn't seem to <laughs> right, fit right. that category and explain how. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I know right. the version is the, is the way, obviously. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. The other. I don't know if Jane's question was heard all the way in the back there that when Hildebrand <laughs> contrasts so sharply the value response with the interest in the merely subjectively satisfying, and Jane says, well, aren't we all a mix of both? <laughs> and of course, he acknowledges uh, that, in fact, in his ethics, there's a discussion of five different forms of the coexistence of value response and the merely subjectively satisfying in persons. 
Um, it's just that philosophers, when they go to work, you know, like to make the clear distinctions. But he's um, quite aware that uh, you know, even in a very noble, value-responding love, there can be all kinds of uh, selfish promptings and things cut from another cloth entering into the uh, love relation. Yeah, yeah. So in phenomenology, you take things as they are. Yes. And back to the, we're looking at what is our experience. Yes. Most of us, our experience is that you start from yes. not necessarily the noble. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Well, he, uh, you know, I think um, he, he does acknowledge, uh, like in the point I just mentioned, that a, a kind of at first largely sensual uh, attraction between man and woman can stand in the service of a, uh, a real acknowledgement of the value of each and of a real value responding love. It can provide a kind of, uh, can ignite, you might say, something that then uh, uh, really belongs to the person and doesn't just remain at a bodily level. <coughs> yeah, please, uh, Maria. Yeah. I mean, it's based on such a history, right? It yeah. distinguishes so carefully between two other kinds of importance. But throughout the nature of love, he is also trying to make a lot of room for in love, the appropriate place for, uh, you know, the objective good for me. Oh, that's right. Um, and that's he right. Also, I mean, yeah. it's subtle, and, and he doesn't, he doesn't yeah. use those terms now right. as maybe as right. the, the technical terms as much as in the ethic. Yeah. But could you say more on the relation of, I mean, his narrowing down love, particularly as a value response. Yeah. But then also, I mean, is there room in Hildegrim for love as a response also to other kinds of importance? Oh, yeah. Or is, is yeah. that then not love? It's such a... Yeah. You know, he distinguishes it from an appetite that's, of course, very... I mean, there's, that, that seems to be different than... Yeah, right. The, what would be motivated, maybe, by other things. And, of course, I mean, he's yeah. insisted and he continues to insist that the value response has to be central Right, yes. But right. it doesn't seem that it's quite the exclusion of... No, no. Um, and I can see from the drift of the questions that it's sounding like an exclusion that I um, hadn't intended. Actually, this gets a bit into the theme of uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but no, Hildebrand, for instance, says that when a man and woman love each other, each becomes... A a great good for the other. So uh, it, it's not, he doesn't dream of trying to explain the whole love between man and woman exclusively in terms of value response. But uh, the beloved person becomes a, a, a capital source of my happiness uh, and, um, and becomes the great good for me. That's why, you know, when a spouse dies, the surviving spouse is devastated because they've been deprived of something profoundly good for themselves. And so the, um, uh, the fact that loving and uh, the <coughs> union with this person and the happiness is something uh, uniquely good for me finds its place. It's just that he doesn't want to let that idea completely take over and block out the value responding core of uh, of love and and in fact he, he he's got the very keen dialectical point the beloved person wouldn't be such a great good for me union with him or her wouldn't be such a blessing but for the lovable intrinsic beauty which I affirm in the value response. So I the union with the beloved is such uh, an enrichment and blessing and source of happiness just because of this, uh, uh, this, this, this beauty that uh, calls for the value response. Yeah, go ahead. So to follow that up, would it be, would it, would it be in the spirit of Hildegard or would it be something that one could possibly rewrite Hildebrand by, by, I mean, not rewrite, but yeah. one could say that value response is at the core of love. I mean, yeah. when he says value response, love is a value response, yeah. it does seem 
Yes, yes, right. Right. Yes, right. Right. I mean, particularly, for example, between spouses. Yeah, right. Where, I mean, the subjective and he leaves room for that. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. much rich development on that. So could one say that yeah. for Hildebrand, the concern is that it has to be the central focus, the value is yeah. the otherwise the love somehow becomes true. Yeah. Well, I, th- I would read him like this. Um, he's saying the first thing to be said about love is that it is a value response. But that's not the last thing to be said. The uh, dimensions of happiness and being benefited and being made to flourish through the love are very important and in later chapters find uh, their place. But you're right, the statement taken all by itself, love is a value response, seems to say, well, that's the main thing. And these these other dimensions uh, uh, are, are in their own way just as fundamental to love. But since the love is value response is somehow foundational, uh, for the others, and so easily overlooked <coughs> by our preoccupation with the flourishing aspects of love that he uh, uh, leads with that affirmation, love is a value response. But in no way is that meant to be an exhaustive or complete account of uh, love. Now I see the hands going up all over the room, and we're just at the point where... John Henry had uh, told me that we should break. You said around 10 after 10, we should take um, a short coffee break. But whoever had their hands up, when we come back after the break, put them up again, and we'll uh, take those questions. Uh, uh, I I think it's supposed to be about a 15-minute break. uh, So it's 10.10. Let's resume at 10.25.